Hello, everyone. Welcome to Rash's World. Today, we have a very special guest, uh, Rabbi Daniel Cohen. Welcome here. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Wonderful. And so I, I like to start off with uh, you introducing yourself, so all my guests introducing themselves in any way they say fit, say they see fit. So what would you say about yourself? I'm a soul <laughs> trying to spread the light. How's that? That's wonderful. That's perfect. That summarizes it. Uh, you have a, a, a couple of books, and I want to focus especially on your book, uh, What Will They Say About You When You Are Gone? Creating a Life mm -hmm. of Legacy. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I find the, the title itself fascinating, and just the, the, the focus on legacy. What is the legacy we leave behind? And I find it very interesting because although it's about the future, really it's about the present not about when we're gone, but what we can do now in the present. Is that correct? Yes, I'm a big believer that, you know, we're all on this earth for a particular reason. Mm -hmm. God invests us with divine potential, talents, encounters, and the gift of health. And no day should be wasted. Uh, no opportunity should be squandered. And the more that we can live life at the highest frequency to really try to unlock the gifts in us and our ability to touch the world every day. That's the, that is our legacy. Yeah. You know, the, the, the notion about thinking how we'll be remembered is the trigger yeah. to lead life, not from crisis to crisis, but to lead life with a sense of calling every day. Yeah. And I find it's really important to stay positive. I mean, things are often uh, better than we think. And, but we uh, currently live in a time of turmoil and distress and uh, constant worrying. And I find even ourselves, our lives are kind of led with like, we're influenced by the past. We worry about the future and basically we get trapped somewhere in between. So how can we bring a uh, shine the light of positivity, both within us and then outward as well? What can we do? So I think one of the most important um, strategies is counting our blessings. I mean, not taking um, anything for granted. Um, I think that when a person experiences a brush with death or something goes wrong, um, obviously we begin to really appreciate what we have. One of the most important traditions in Judaism is when you wake up in the morning, the way you start the morning determines your altitude for the rest of the day. So the first words out of our mouth should not be, oh my gosh, it's like an alarm clock. I have all this stuff to do. But Zig Ziglar would say, it's not an alarm clock. It's an opportunity clock. Mm -hmm. God has given me this new life. And I want to be grateful for the blessings that I have, that I can open up my eyes, that I can walk, that I can talk, that I can move. And then most importantly, that God believes in me. That if God actually breathed into me the breath of life today, he sometimes believes in us more than we believe in ourselves. And then when we affirm that, I'm getting a big bear hug every morning. Mm -hmm. And God believes there's something for me to accomplish. And gratitude is important. Also, uh, being fully present in the moments that we experience. Every moment, like right now, will never happen again in the world. Mm -hmm. And rather than lament the darkness, I need to increase the light. Rather than think about the past or anticipate the future, I need to unlock the gift of the present. And, and, and when we can do that, um, that really gives us an ability to slow down time, to instill something positive. And I said this to somebody recently who was saying something the same to me. I said, he said, Rabbi, do you have any words of encouragement for me before I go back to the world? I said, I got two words for you. Choose life. Choose life. And you would think, because that was actually one of the main messages that Moses says at the end of his life. He says, I've given before you life and death, blessing and curse, choose life. And the question is, if somebody has the choice between life and death, of course, they're going to choose life. But a lot of people don't choose life. Mm -hmm. They just let life overwhelm them. And every day is a moment to emit a positive word, to do a kind act, to light a candle because we never know where that flame is going to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's like we have the term starting on the right foot when you start starting your, your day. And so, so what often happens, though, we start off okay, and then there's like setbacks. And I think it's kind of rebouncing or finding uh, ourselves back to the center is important. So I find that uh, to kind of ground myself, too, and say, okay, well, this setback, 
is okay, but I'm going to deal with it. And I have the opportunity to actually also learn from it. And when you talk about unique moment in time, this is unique in the way a chess game looks, they look the same, but they're, they're, they're unique each time. And the other thing is we are unique as well. So we have uniqueness within uniqueness and anything that happens to us will be unique in itself. And really to, to see that and not get caught in a way of like, oh, this is routine. And it's not, it cannot be. <laughs> I mean, the, the truth is, is that the challenges that each person faces are designed for us mm -hmm. in order to exercise our spiritual muscles for her to grow from those experiencing. And um, that to me is like one of the most important kind of mind shift challenges that we face. And even in those moments when, for example, things don't go our way, uh, rather than wonder why, we have to ask ourselves for what? Like uh, somebody said to me that a great mystical teacher said, everybody needs a worry box. Mm -hmm. So you take a box and you allow yourself 15 minutes every day to put all the worries in there from 8 a.m. or 8.15, whatever it is. The rest of the day, no worrying. It doesn't accomplish anything. Mm -hmm. All it does is distracts us yeah. from actually trying to do something positive in the world. So I think that that's another important um, strategy. Every wall is a door. That's important to, rep to understand. There are many times when we feel we're facing a wall, but all God is doing is, is pushing us through a new door so we can unleash new light in ourselves that we never realized was possible. I like that. And it's like often when we have challenges, we kind of uh, kind of take it too seriously often or get scared. And it's in the end, uh, actually not that bad, but the worrying ma magnifies it. And so one of the things that I've done is curiosity and say, oh, this is an interesting challenge. And just just that bit of a mindset of kind of openness, the, the flexibility really helps. And just like, deep down believing is like, yeah, I got this. And uh, there's a reason for this that I don't know. And I, I like uh, not asking why. Now I have to deal with this. Let's get it on. I think that that really helps. And what I really like too is you have the Elijah moment and uh, what we can do actively to create uh, more positivity in the world. And it kind of bounces back to us as well. So let's let's talk about this anticipatory kindness that uh, that you have. I find that fascinating. Well, you've summed it up very well. I mean, the Elijah moment to me is probably one of the uh, key secrets to, to eternal impact. And I'll give a little bit of the background. So Elijah is a person who kind of shows up when we need it most. He's the name of a prophet in the scriptures. And uh, there's a story about a young man who goes to a mystic and says to him, I want to see Elijah the prophet. So the mystic says to him, I want you to go uh, to visit this widow for the weekend, for the Sabbath, bring some food, and I promise you you'll see Elijah the prophet. So he goes Friday night, he goes Saturday, no Elijah the prophet. He comes back Sunday to the mystics. You promised me I would see Elijah the prophet. So he says, look, I want you to bring food back to the widow this coming Friday. And I promise this time you'll see Elijah the prophet. So he's within earshot of the widow. And he hears the young child crying out to the mother saying, mommy, where are we going to get food from for this weekend, for this Sabbath? And the mother turns to the child and says, just like Elijah came last week, Elijah is going to come again. And it was in that moment that he realized that he was the Elijah that this woman was waiting for. Discovering your Elijah moment means that we may not be able to change the world. But we can change the world of one person every day. Yeah. And if somebody else is in our orbit, God designed for that person to be there. And there must be some eternal impact or light that I can shine. Mm -hmm. And to me, you know, and there's no single individual in the universe that has the same encounter and roadmap every day. And that really is an affirmation that God believes there's some hidden light in every moment, in every time, in every place. And the Elijah moment is an anticipatory way of looking at life to unlock those moments. I like to do Elijah moments in the elevator. It was funny. I was recently in an elevator in New York City. In an elevator, you're there for 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. I walk into the elevator and everybody's looking at their phones. Yeah. And I said, hello, guys. Let's talk to each other. How you doing? <laughs> at least you, you make their day. Like, why should people be zoned in? And they leave the elevator, maybe thinking either I'm a little bit nuts or maybe they're feeling a little bit better about <laughs> themselves. 
And either way, it's fine. I mean, they go way, and talk fine. about the economy. Guess what? I saw this this crazy person who started talking on the elevator, and that's great. It makes their day. And again, that that it just have to be a very small act. It doesn't have to be a big thing. And I love that. Yeah. And it's often like often ourselves, our attitude when we see people as like enemies or as somebody we don't like. And I found actually a lot of people that I initially I don't like. It, it sometimes changes and I shift. It's like, well, I actually like them now. So it's like, it's, it's something that's transitory. So not getting stuck in one way of thinking or one way of feeling and being open to, to the whole person. And uh, when you see often another side of the person, then you realize, oh, maybe they're not as mean or angry and so on as, as I thought they would be. And to open up to those possibilities, I think. Yeah. And I think that, you know, everybody has the opportunity to do this and to, find ways through the acts of kindness, mm -hmm. we actually begin to see the face of God in another human being. There's a very important idea that we don't wait to be asked. If every human being is created in God's image, which we believe to be the case, then I need to see that in them. And I need to light that up in them by doing something nice to make them smile. You know, when I smile, they smile. It's funny. And this is another great example of it. A friend of mine, thank God, recovered from cancer, and he was at Sloan Kettering. Hmm. And I said to him, Sloan Kettering has a great reputation. Can you tell me something about your experience there? He said, Rabbi, I'll never forget the doorman. <laughs> he didn't say, he said, the doorman. <laughs> he said, as I was leaving Sloan Kettering, the doorman said to me, I want to wish you well, and I hope I'll never see you again. And that's the power of three seconds of a doorman mm. to create this eternal good feeling about that institution. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And the, the feeling you, you, you get when, when you walk out of there and it's like, yeah, I don't want to go back. And it's like, yeah, kind of like motivating you to not, you know, as, as exactly. Exactly. Back. And he's, he's the doorman. I'll give you another, like there was a woman whose husband passed away a number of years ago. And she said to me, my husband was sick in bed in the hospital for many months. And you would think, like, what can he do? He's kind of laid up in bed. He made it his mission to ensure that anybody that left his room felt better about themselves than when they came in. Yeah. And whether it was the doctor, the nurse, the janitor, he wanted to share a kind word. And his room, even though he was physically limited, he unleashed so much of his light. And it was a room that was a life-giving room. Mm -hmm. And he was able to take his limitations and not be bound by them, but really unlock a lot of music that was in his soul and in other people as well. Mm -hmm. And and talk about the, the music in our soul. I want to talk about vocation, which is something that I'm very fascinated with, of like finding your vocation. And something that I find is is aligned with that is intuition. And to to in many ways, I find it's really intuition that's been driving my best decisions and often against reason, which is surprising, where it seems like that seems to be a very dumb choice to do, but it seems like the right choice. And uh, and just to give an example, I, I went to Mexico after I graduated here and uh, to work uh, as, a, as a teacher. And um, it was in terms of wages, I had student loans and the wages were like below a uh, minimum minimum wage uh, here. And so it seemed like rationally the worst choice you can make, but that's how I met my wife. So, and that was the intuition, the intuition that, that drove me. And uh, really, I, I, I really appreciate listening to that and not listening to the voice of reason or my parents who would say, mm. don't do this, you know? And um, so how can we get more in touch with that of finding also the, the, the right path in our lives? What would you say? Well, I would say that, you know, one of the key things is to turn off the outside noise Mm -hmm. and to listen deeply to what's going on inside your soul. Yeah. I mean, everybody has a song to sing in their soul. Yeah. And sometimes we're so busy and we're so connected to other things that we're not connected to the song inside of our soul. So I always suggest that people take, take walks, put mm -hmm. the phone away, mm -hmm. just listen deeply into what values are most important to me. What do I want out of life? I mean, the whole idea behind the book that I wrote at a new venture that I started called the Legacy Academy, which is a way actually to help people through this journey, was to give people the tools to tap into their inner voice. Because you're right, the inner voice 
the song is very powerful, but if people haven't gotten in touch with it, you can't hear it. Mm -hmm. um, and it does take getting rid of a lot of the clutter to be able to do it. You know, one story that I like to share a lot is a fellow who was on a farm and he lost his watch. And um, it was a very valuable watch. It was in the barn house and everybody was running around for like 15 minutes, 10 people and they're running around trying to find the watch. Nobody could find the watch. Well, they all went in for lunch. And then about 10 minutes later, a young boy, eight years old, came back and said, I found the watch. And the farmer said to him, how'd you find it? We had 10 people in there running around. He said, all I did was I put my head on the ground and I listened to the ticking of the watch. <laughs> but when there's a lot of noise, you're not listening to any yeah. ticking. Yeah. So I think, I think you're right. I mean, you know, um, the soul has a lot to say. The other thing that I want to say in terms of the roles that we play in this world is to recognize two things. Our roles are not our souls. Our roles are not our souls. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you ask somebody what they do and they define what they do. I'm an accountant. I'm a lawyer. I'm a teacher. That's what you do. It's not who you are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I always say to people, besides the fact that you do good in the world, what else do you do? <laughs> and I want them to understand like, okay, it's nice that you're a lawyer, but that's not who you are. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So I but think- we get caught up in that though. This is like- I know. Too, get, which is unfortunate, yeah. hundred percent. So, so I think that part of, you know, the process of self-reflection and growth is understanding a little bit more about, again, what is really important in my life. When you begin to ask people that question of how do you want to be remembered? Nobody's going to want to say, I was remembered. I want to be remembered for being, I want to be remembered for being a lawyer and accountant. They say, I want to be remembered for- my authenticity, my integrity, my kindness, the wisdom that I gave to people, the mentorship. So then people begin to say, that's really important. So that's one thing to think about. The other one is, um, it's a beautiful story that to me gives me, and I think everybody, a lot of um, affirmation about our unique role. So there is a well-known conductor named Tuscanini. I don't know if you've heard of him before. And um the story that's told that, you know, he composed the symphony with, I don't know, maybe 14 violins or something like that. So later on in his life, he was being interviewed. And the guy who interviewed him said, look, I want to listen to one of your symphonies that's being played with you. And I want to get your response. So he's sitting with Tuscanini. At the end of the Tuscanini, he says, I only heard 13 violins. I didn't hear 14. The guy couldn't believe it. He said, here we are a thousand miles away. You can hear the difference between 13 and 14. He said to him, well, I'm the conductor. I was the one who wrote the piece. And I know what each note means and when each one is played. God is the conductor for all of us. Every single one of us is trying to create our own unique note and music in the world. And don't think that if we don't play our music, it's not going to affect the the, the heavenly symphony of God's music that he wants to bring to the world. So, you know, we can make great music in the world. We can bring peace and love and, and all that, but don't underestimate our part in making that beautiful music. But we're often out of tune. And I, I think that that kind of like finding your your inner voice and the, the, the song, I, I love that. And we all have this unique song. But I find like what happens is we're like looking for something else. We're not happy with who we are. We're afraid that others will not accept us and they won't like our song. And so one, one thing I, I, I have an issue with when people say be a better version of yourself. And I'm thinking just be your unique self who you are. And that's the best <laughs> version you can be. Why be something else? And if we all did that and channeled into that, that unique song that is, again, the only one out there. And I think to me, if people talk about the meaning of life, it's just become more yourself. Listen to that, become that song. And that's it. I think that's, that's in many ways our, our purpose uh, in, in, in this life. Yeah, I think it's important though also, by the way, because sometimes people um, are trying to live counterfeit versions of themselves. Because they're actually thinking that what's valuable is what the world tells them is valuable. And they're yeah. chasing things that are fleeting. Yeah. So I think that's the benefit of having a mentor, you know, having guides who say to you, look, this is who you really are. Because not everybody's able to identify that. But you need other people to take away all the shells and sometimes the veils that we have to reveal that. And then you're right. Be yourself. Because if you really are your true authentic self, you're going to be doing great. 
if you if you live a soulful life. Yeah, and and we, we, our DNA is unique. I mean, we are unique. It's such a miracle that people no two, no two people are alike, and they might they are identical twins, but they're not alike. And I find that fascinating. It's like uh, trying to understand that. How is that? even possible in a, in, a, in a rational way of thinking and i don't see people give that enough credit that everything is unique and not not just the beings but like a leaf or a flower or anything you pick but we have this mm -hmm. idea that uh, we see everything kind of equal the same kind of drab and colorless and and so it's it's really like getting in touch with that that that, that uniqueness of each thing and each being and each person yeah i mean that's again where you know a big believer also and just creating certain rituals that remind us of uh, the uniqueness of every day, uh, the beauty in the world. I mean, again, many times people walk around the world blind to the beauty. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Hessel said to live life with radical amazement. Wow. <laughs> like, this is amazing. I mean, you know, the flowers are blooming. I'm yeah. surrounded by all these blessings what am I going to, you know, and then, and then taking it to the next level. And I think that's, you know, one of the key things, you know, when somebody is drowning yeah. and then they are saved, every breath becomes so meaningful. Yes. yes. And that's something that um, we need to be more, more conscious, conscious of a, a beautiful story that I think about a lot. It was in the height of COVID there was a man from Italy in his 90s, 93, I think, and he had he had COVID and he was put on a ventilator. And as he was leaving the hospital, and thank God he recovered, he was given the bill for a ventilator for one day. And he started to cry. And the doctor said to him, are you crying because the bill for the ventilator is so much? He said, I'm not crying for that. I can afford to pay. He said, but I've been breathing God's air for free for 93 years. <laughs> and now I know how much one day's breath is worth. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, I, I find like also for me was stopping the, the monkey chatter in my brain, the constant thinking and worrying and, and all that again, obsessed about the past, but the work and things that really on the grand scale of things don't matter. But we mm -hmm. get obsessed though with that. But then when I took a walk and I, I kind of was able to just focus and be mindful and present in that moment, I noticed the mating rituals of ducks. And that was fascinating. And I had never seen that. I've been to that pond many times. I'd never noticed it because of all the, the extra thinking and worrying. And suddenly it's like, I, this is amazing. And I think we can't really do that. We can't worry and be positive and, and connect with ourselves at the same time. So they, I like the idea of frequency. It's like, okay, well, let's, let's get to a higher frequency where these things kind of fall, fall apart and they don't really matter. Really focus on what is the most important thing, the ducks in this moment or our conversation right now, this podcast. I think that's, that's hugely important. Yeah. No, for sure. I mean, the notion of letting go and letting God and knowing what we can control and what we can't control mm -hmm. is really an important, important way to kind of lead life. Because again, we can't change what happens to us, mm -hmm. but we can change how we see the world around us. And um, I mean, I just, you know, <laughs> I forgot who I was talking to recently, but again, like, you know, life is so fragile. Oh, yeah. I mean, in an instant things, God forbid can change. So, you know, we have to recognize that we have infinite potential for greatness and to really try to to optimize that. And, and, and greatness is about really just, just lifting up those around us yeah. uh, and not underestimating the power of even a kind word. And I want to talk about this for a minute because we live in a wor world where people are able to communicate so easily. But we don't, we don't oftentimes appreciate the power of a negative word and also the power of a positive word. We have the capacity now, whether it's through texts or emails or Zooms to communicate instantaneously. And we need to be more mindful of how do we harness that technology um, to really make a difference in somebody's life. I mean, you know, when you, when you, when you just reach out to somebody and say, to them, you matter, I'm thinking about you. It means a lot to people. But it's a matter of right. focus, right? really the spotlight, because I, I get a lot of positive messages and uh, suddenly there's that one person who has a negative comment <laughs> and I harbor on that. And so it's not a rational thing to do, but it's like the changing that. It's like, okay, 
there's always going to be some negativity somewhere and that's their opinion and it shouldn't affect me and finding ways of really like changing the focus here yeah yeah no 100 percent. and i think that you know the nature of a person it's like the missing tile syndrome that the tiles could be all over, but there's one tile yeah, and it yeah, bothers yeah. me, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, you know, that's just kind of getting us off our game. The idea is do what you can. Mm-hmm. Um, King Solomon, who was one of the wisest of all people, said in Ecclesiastes, whatever in your power, just do. Just do positive. Put it out there. And then God will handle the rest. I'm very curious here, just telling them to, to finish off here. I'm very curious about how did you find your path and your specifically of, of becoming a rabbi and so on? Is there anything you'd like to share? Like how, how did you find this path for yourself, your vocation and your um, insight? Uh, part of it was, I mean, when I was one month old, I started to talk and I said, I wanted to be a rabbi. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. I was like, <laughs> why not? Not quite. <laughs> just made that one up just for you. Um, I mean, I agree. <laughs> Look, I, I give my parents a lot of credit. I think that um, big believers in, in in gratitude of influencing people in a positive way. I grew up in a very warm Jewish home. We had guests all the time, a strong sense of, of social responsibility. Um, you know, it's interesting, though, more than anything else, it was positive experiences that I had that touched my heart and made me realize that this was a path that I wanted to follow. It was, less, it was less of an intellectual. I mean, I thought about becoming a doctor, like most, that's what my grandmother wanted or a lawyer, mm-hmm. you know, and I actually tried my hand at a little bit of that, but then my soul sang when I got involved in working with youth, when I got involved in uh, organizing Friday night Shabbat dinners and just felt like this is where, this is where, where my heart is. Um, but I think it's important to recognize, and this is a little bit of the theme in the, the latest book that I wrote called the secret of the light that, we can bring God's light everywhere, regardless of what role we play. Mm-hmm. It's whether or not we reveal our soul. And I could be a lawyer, a doctor, I could be a podcast, I could be a writer, mother, father, whatever it is. You can bring light wherever you are. Mm-hmm. And it could be in the supermarket. It can be on the phone. It can be in the ball field. Um, and I think, you know, th- that's what we're all here for. Engage. I guess that's one of my last messages is, I believe in something, you know what a mitzvah is, by the way, a mitzvah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, there's a really important idea. Everybody has what I call a mitzvah mobile hotspot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In other yeah. words, if somebody is within your orbit, light them up, yeah. say something positive. Um, and then your world will be positive and God will give you a reason to smile. If you make other people smile. On that note, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Rabbi thank you. Daniel Cohen. God bless you. Your book is What Will They Say About You When You're Gone? Creating a Life of Legacy. And you also have The Secret of the Light. Uh, thank you so much for being here and for spending some time with me and for your positive messages. Uh, it's, it's thank really you. God bless you. Thank you. Take care.